All righty. I think we're all here and ready to get started. Uh, my name is Nancy Proctor. I'm Chief Strategy Officer at the Peel, and it's my very great pleasure to welcome you all to this final talk in the Baltimore National Heritage Area's It's More Than History lecture series. For today's online program, you can turn on captions, and there is an ASL interpreter for today's program. Thank you for joining us. The recording and the transcript will be available afterwards, and you'll get an email uh, with that link. I'd also like to add that accessibility is a core value at the Peel, so you'll find our programs ASL interpreted and captioned almost always, so please tell your friends. Our aim is to be accessible to all. The Peel's mission is about amplifying and sharing the voices and stories that too often have been overlooked or intentionally erased from the historical record. So before we get started, I'd like to acknowledge that the Peel in Baltimore stands on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded lands of a number of indigenous peoples, including the Lenape and the Susquehannock. Our work is ongoing to better understand the pre-colonial history of our city and region, and also to support the indigenous peoples who are part of our communities today. I'd like to thank Ryan Coons and the Maryland State Arts Council for the land acknowledgement references they've made available to us, and to local leaders like Ashley Minner for ensuring that Indigenous voices are heard and recognized in Baltimore today. You can pick up your copy of Reservation, East Baltimore's Historic American Indian Walking Tour Map <clears throat> from the Peel, and also download the Guide to Indigenous Baltimore app for free. <clears throat> Excuse me. We're also hosting a really important conversation in person at the Peel on Sunday from 1 to 3 p.m about the Women's Coalition for Change, which was an art activist initiative against rape culture that started at the University of Maryland in the 1990s. You can also see Catalepsis, the new immersive theater experience from Submersive Productions at the Peel through May 7th. And please join us on May 10th at 2.30 p.m. for the Maryland Historical Trust 2023 Preservation Awards Ceremony. The Peel is very proud to be a recipient of this year's Excellence in Institutional Rehabilitation Award for our recent renovations. Now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce Shantae Daniels from the Baltimore National Heritage Area. Shantae, thank you for once again bringing compelling and insightful presenters and programs to the Peel as part of your It's More Than History Lunchtime Lecture Series. Please take it away. Well, welcome everyone for joining us for the last, um, as Nancy said, our last series in um, It's More Than History. One of the things that we have been doing with this is bringing um, just stories that people are interested in or have um, an idea that they just want to know more. So um, in the chat today, if there's something that you'd like to know more about or that we can present next year, I would um, greatly appreciate that. And we will find um, uh, lecturers or historians that can answer those questions about Baltimore that you I've always been wondering about. I would also like to advise everyone that's on the call today that our Heritage Investment Grant Program is open. If you are in the National Heritage Area Boundary and you are a cultural or a heritage institution, please go to our website and look up the requirements and the regulations for proposals. And then the most important thing is our uh, what makes Baltimore Charming um, photo contest. Right now we are sponsoring a photo contest from now until December 31st. And I'm gonna let maybe somebody out there, maybe Nancy, what makes Baltimore Charming? Oh, Nancy's gone. So- I'm Here, sorry, did you want me to chime in via Viva Voce yeah. or just through yeah. the chat? I want you to tell me what makes Baltimore charming, Nancy. Well, you know what? I noticed that our friend Doreen Bolger is with us today. And so I will tell this version of my story. Um, I uh, was I first came to work in Baltimore thanks to Doreen Boulder, who recruited me to work at the Baltimore Museum of Art. I fell in love with the city because of all of its beautiful historic buildings. And I stayed because of the people. So I'd say that's what makes Baltimore charming. So we are asking uh, amateur photographers, um, 16 and, and above, to submit their photos to the contest that are 
that bring the people alive. Um, of course, we have great buildings, we have great landscapes, we have all of these wonderful assets, but the biggest asset that makes a city what it is are the people. So um, that's the biggest thing that's happening right now. And there's more to come from the Baltimore National Heritage Area, but um, I would like to um, introduce our speakers for the day. Um, I'll let them talk a little bit about themselves. I think that they do much better at it, but I am so glad to welcome um, Jackson Gilman Forlini. I probably got that wrong again, um, who is a wonderful partner with Appeal and the Baltimore National Heritage Area um, for the city of Baltimore in the Historic Preservation um, um, Office. So we are welcoming him um, today to tell us why Baltimore has so many historic buildings. And I'd also like to invite another guest who is a great partner of the heritage area, and that is Matt Hankins. Matt Hankins is a historic preservationist tradesman, and he has a wealth of knowledge about architecture. So I'm not quite sure how this lecture is going to go with them tag teaming, but I'm sure you will find lots of information that you did not know about Baltimore. Thank you very much for being here, and we will see you out and about. Thank you, Shantae. It's a pleasure to be here and also a pleasure working with Matt, who I've known for many years, but this is our first time presenting together. Um, so as Shantae mentioned, um, my name is Jackson Gilman Forlini. I work for the Baltimore City Department of General Services. So we are the property owners and maintainers for the city's um, portfolio of buildings. And I specifically am the historic preservation officer. So I have the pleasure of working with those city owned buildings that are historic. Um, and I'll turn it over to Matt. Would you, would you like to say anything to introduce yourself? Sure. My name's Matt Hankins. I am uh, the restoration shop supervisor for a historic contractor here in Baltimore called Worcester Eisenbrandt. Uh, we do commercial restoration throughout the region, Baltimore, Washington, uh, Virginia, and further. Uh, and we uh, have worked on a fair number of buildings uh, that you might see in the presentation today. And uh, so, yeah, I'm, I, I'm a architectural historian, craftsperson, and uh, all around interesting guy. <laughs> so, so what, yeah. what we're going to do today is we're going to bring you through a survey of every um, or most um, styles of architecture of, and throughout architectural history. But what makes this a particularly special uh, survey of architectural history is that all of the examples we're going to look at are not just located in Baltimore City, but are also owned by the city government. Uh, and this shows a remarkable diversity of architectural style, uh, even just within the city government's portfolio of real estate. Uh, which speaks to a broader uh, significance, architectural significance of the built environment in Baltimore City generally. Um, and, but let's start, I guess, Matt, if you'll pull up the uh, the PowerPoint, um, I'll, I'll kick things off with a, a discussion which directly addresses the question which has been posed in the title for this presentation, why does Baltimore City own so many historic buildings. So if you came for just the answer to this question, uh, you'll, you'll, you're gonna get your dessert first. Um, and then, you know, you can skip the vegetable course later if you want, but I hope you'll stick around. Uh, so the um, the question here, why, does we, why do we have so many historic buildings? Well, there are two categories, you could say, of properties um, that fall into this, this category of historic buildings the city owns. One, category are buildings that the city has constructed um, and for its own use, for municipal services. And these are buildings that through outstanding design uh, have acquired significance over time and have become considered historic. The other category is uh, buildings that were built at one time not for a municipal use, uh, but which acquired significance through, you know, uh, an association with important people or events or design, and that the city acquired as a means of preserving those buildings. And they have been converted into oftentimes a museum, 
uh, and we'll talk about some of those as we go through. Uh, also within this category are buildings that were endangered or uh, were likely to suffer demolition, and so the city acquired them to save them. And then, of course, there are buildings which sort of fit into this category, second category, which is that they were acquired at the time uh, the city acquired a city park. Oftentimes, parks, uh, due to their history, uh, also have historic buildings on them. Open lands tends to be part, at least in the city, of uh, historic estates uh, that formed before the formation or encroachment upon them by the city. Uh, and so that's that's another another of that second category. Um, so we'll just stay on this slide for a second. Um, I want to talk or yeah, let's let's go back actually, Matt, to the to the the, the previous slide. I just wanted to mention a few things about this. Now, um, the in the first category or the second one, I mean, uh, where the city has acquired buildings specifically to save them. Uh, this is of particular interest to me uh, as the historic preservation officer because, you know, when we talk, talk about the preservation tools that government has uh, it's at its disposable, disposable. Uh, we have the National Register, Section 106 reviews, uh, local landmark designations, uh, all of these things come into play, but actually ownership is a much older, more fundamental means by which government can save a building. Um, and in fact, you know, this has a very long precedent going back to sort of the first example of this in US history, which was in 1816, when the state of Pennsylvania acquired Independence Hall specifically to save it from demolition. Uh, and then a few decades after that, New York State acquired Washington's headquarters in Newburgh, New York, um, and, and and they have both entities have continued uh, to to own these buildings, and they, this was a way to forestall demolition. Ownership, I think, even more than a local landmark designation, uh, represents a total commitment to the cost of ownership uh, and to the preservation of a historic building. Because uh, you know, when you're the owner, uh, the buck stops with you. Uh, you have to do what you can to preserve it, um, and so it, this is it, it, it's a more it's a more fundamental uh, way of preserving a building. Uh, the other sort of reason why a lot of these buildings were acquired it comes out of um, a drive for nationalism. Uh, a lot of the buildings that Baltimore City owns that were became museums were acquired in the 1920s. Following World War One, there was this sort of wave of of uh, fervor for building a national identity founded upon the um, the country's earlier colonial past. Uh, and you think of like Colonial Williamsburg as sort of the prime example of this. But this was also the time when Fort McHenry uh, became a uh, national or a historic site, site and historic shrine. Uh, and the city also acquired properties as part of this same movement. And those include the flag house, which we'll look at as among them, the, the shot tower, um, and uh, a restoration of Mount Clare was undertaken at this time. And so there, this, this is another key reason why the city owns so many of these buildings is, uh, is identity, uh, and particularly national identity, and then later on uh, local identity as well. Uh, and so that brings us sort of the, to the, the other main reason here. And if you take away one thing from this presentation, the reason why we have so many historic buildings is, is civic pride. Uh, the buildings that the city commissioned were commissioned with outstanding design in order to foster civic pride. Uh, there's a sort of older idea that beautiful buildings would foster good citizens or inspire good citizenship, uh, which we've kind of got away from a little bit, uh, particularly after World War II. Uh, but still to this day, you know, uh, Nancy mentioned she fell in love with the, his the, the historic buildings in this city. Uh, the, um, the historic fabric is what imbues a sense of character and a sense of place to the city. Uh, and so ownership of these historic buildings is representative of the um, city's desire to foster a nat natural sense of civic pride. Uh, whether it be through acquisition or through commissioning uh, buildings. So um, with that, uh, let's, I guess, we'll start off and go through um, some examples of ways that the city has um, created a, a beautiful and uh, unique urban landscape uh, through acquisition and through construction. Uh, so we're going to start here uh, with Mount Clare which uh, was acquired very early, 1890, um, as part of the city's creation of Carroll Park, where it resides. This is the oldest 
building in the city, um, uh, constructed roughly in 1760. Uh, so Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about the the uh, the style and the the de architectural design a little? So this building is a, a really nice example of uh, Georgian architecture. You can see uh, on the slide the dates there. The, the, so the dates of some of these uh, are, can can vary slightly depending on sources and uh, and such. So, uh, but we have about 1750 to 1790. And the Georgian arch architecture is uh, one of the primary uh, markers of it is symmetry. Uh, so you can see the, the the symmetry in this particular building. Now the the wings are a, an actual later addition that were added by the city. Uh, the main mass of the house is the original section. Um, but you see the symmetry. You also see the Palladian window, which is the, the window in the rear of the house in the color photo with the arched uh, center section and the two lower square parts. That's a very uh, common theme in uh, Georgian architecture. Uh, so the, the Georgian architecture has very heavy details. So the, the, the profiles of the moldings are thick and heavy. The muttons on the sash are thick and heavy. And so you have uh, that kind of uh, thicker details. And that has to do somewhat with the technology available. Uh, but also, they were copying uh, Roman architecture. So they were studying. There was a lot of interest in, in uh, antiquity. And they were studying the architecture of Rome. And so in Rome, you see a lot of uh, arches and uh, and circles used. So you're going to see a lot of that in the, the Georgian architecture. Um, and you can see some of it here at Mount Clare with the arched windows and the Palladian windows and uh, the smaller pieces of glass uh, in the windows. That's all hallmark of Georgian architecture. Yeah. All right, let's, uh, well, well, let's, well, we're going to uh, move on now uh, to the next slide, I think. Um, again, this is uh, going to be a, this is sort of a, the lightning round through, through architectural design and history here. Uh, I, but I mentioned earlier the flag house, um, this definitely was acquired with the intent of fostering this sense of national identity. Uh, obviously the location where Mary Pickersgill sewed the original Star Spangled Banner um, and uh, acquired in 1927. And in fact, you know, the city owns it. It's leased to the Flag House Association, which operates it. Uh, and they have been there um, since the city acquired it uh, when they were uh, sort of chartered by uh, city ordinance. Uh, so this was an example where the city took a very heavy hand, uh, shall we say, in creating a museum. Uh, and it is a great example of uh, federal architecture. Isn't that right, Matt? It is. Uh, so the federal period of architecture, which is a little bit after the Georgian, uh, is hallmarked with the lighter details. We talked about the heavy details in the Georgian uh, style. In the federal style, you're getting a lot more light details. So the glass, the pieces of glass are larger. The profiles of the window muttons is, is smaller. Uh, things are a little bit lighter in and uh, in in look and appearance, um, and uh, you get um, not necessarily on this particular uh, example, but in other buildings in the city, you'll see uh, facade panels, little panels in the facade made of wood. Uh, you're going to see elliptical fan lights. So, uh, in the study of the of the classics, it was discovered that the Romans had based their design on the Greeks. And so suddenly there was an urge to follow the older style, the, the more original style. And so the Greeks based their uh, curves and, and, and arch, arches on the ellipse. And so in the federal period, you start seeing more things based on ellipses, not just windows and, and arches, but even the molding profiles are based on the ellipse. And so you'll get uh, a Roman OG or a Roman Ovalo has a based on a round circle, whereas the Greek OG and Ovalo are based on more elliptical profiles. And so all of those things are uh, ways to identify the difference between a federal period building and a Georgian period building.
And I, uh, I think you can advance the next slide, Matt. Sure. So, um, okay, so the, the battle monument now, here we get to the, the first example of the first category, which was the buildings that the city commissioned itself for its own uh, use or purposes. Um, and this is, uh, I, I believe, the from someone on the call who's more knowledgeable than I may correct me, but the first example of a public uh, monument in the United States. Um, and it is a uh, a great example of Egyptian revival, which Matt will talk about. But when we talk about city, civic pride, obviously this is the inspiration for the city seal uh, and appears on the city's official flag. And so uh, it has a lot of symbolic value uh, in addition to its historical and architectural value. Yes, this is a, an excellent example of Egyptian revival. There were actually uh, other buildings in the city that had this style, but this is one of the ones uh, that's uh, still survived or structures that survives. Uh, the Egyptian revival, again, an interest in uh, early uh, culture and early architecture and design. And so what you have is the lower part of this uh, monument is, is built to look like a tomb with its uh, rusticated and battered or, or slanted walls. Um, and then you've got, uh, you've got some, some lotus you see in the, the image on the bottom right, you've got some lotus leaf uh, uh, design the, uh, on the monument, the, the crown around the base is uh, based on a lotus leaf. And you just have a lot of uh, Egyptian motifs throughout, uh, again, celebrating um, the early uh, classic designs and, and architecture uh, as it was uh, super popular uh, with, uh, with designers and architects. All right, now we've, we move on uh, to our next example, McKim's Free School. Uh, this is another one where the city had acquired it at a later date. So this was built as a sort of uh, charitable um, and, uh, uh, enterprise uh, by the uh, philanthropist Isaac McKim uh, as a, uh, exactly that, a, a school which offered a free education uh, to uh, students who couldn't otherwise afford an education at a time before the formation of the public school system. Uh, this was acquired at a relatively late date, 1972. Uh, and in fact, um, it was through the efforts of Baltimore's uh, Quaker community um, that, that this building was acquired by the city uh, as with the specific intent of preserving it and the adjacent uh, Quaker uh, Friends Meeting House. Uh, which is just on the other side of Asquith Street. Um, it's funny too, because actually in doing some of my research, I found that there was quite a bit of resistance on the part of the city uh, to acquire this. There was a bit of sort of backroom, backdoor negotiations that happened with then Mayor William Donald Schaefer. Um, but uh, ultimately it, it was uh, decided that the city would acquire it uh, with the intent of preserving it. Um, and the city has owned it ever since. And it, it continues its uh, charitable mission uh, to this day uh, under lease. So Matt, why don't you talk a little bit about the design? This is a, this is a pretty special one, isn't it? It is. The, uh, as, we, as we move through this, the, uh, the buildings that we're going to talk about today, uh, we could all sit and, and argue about a couple of them as far as whether it's this style or whether it has more characteristics of this style. But this one is a no doubter as far as being Greek revival. Uh, in fact, it, it's so specific that it's actually designed based on uh, some surviving examples in Greece. Uh, the front facade of this building is uh, based on the Theseum in Athens, and then the side walls are based on the Propylaea uh, on the Acropolis. And so the architects who are uh, William Howard and William Small actually uh, very specifically drew upon examples of uh, buildings in Greece and in Athens in order to design and build this building. And again, that was pretty popular being a, being an, an educational facility, drawing on the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the tradition of, of the Greeks in education. Uh, so you have the pedimented, uh, facade with, uh, you know, the, the, 
the big uh, heavy pediment, all of the Doric sam uh, examples, the, the Doric columns uh, along the front. Um, and it just, as soon as you encounter this building, it does look like it was just pulled right out of Athens and, and, and plopped down in Baltimore. So it's a, a really wonderful high example of Greek revival, which uh, a textbook example of Greek revival, which you don't normally encounter with with things. Usually there's a little bit of nuance and a little bit of variety, but this one is a is a really wonderful example of uh, of the style. Okay, so um, again, I was talking about earlier, you know, civic pride, right? Uh, this is a great example of that. It's drawn into uh, sharp relief here because we have um, one of the most uh, prosaic buildings in Baltimore in terms of its function, but one of the most interesting in terms of its architectural style. Uh, the Clifton Park Valve House, no doubt many of you are familiar, it's a defunct waterworks infrastructure. It housed the uh, valve, which controlled water flow from Lake Montebello into Lake Clifton, uh, which existed as a reservoir prior to the construction of Lake Clifton High School on that same site. Now, this is one where um, it's very emblematic, emblematic of a time when the city really had high ideals uh, in terms of creating a, a things of beauty that serve rather um, sort of utilitarian functions. Um, it's just a water valve, but yet we have this wonderful uh, Gothic revival style. Uh, and so, you know, this is a great example of how the category of, you know, the city using design as a kind of political message, using architectural design as a political message to show that this is a city that had come into its own, um, that we had clean drinking water and that we had beautiful buildings in order to celebrate that achievement. Uh, so, so Matt, what tell, tell us a little bit about the, uh, the Gothic Revival style here. Absolutely. So this is Gothic Revival. And just to tack on a little bit with what Jackson said, there's going to be a couple more um, uh, water uh facility buildings that we talk about, but there's there's a bunch in Baltimore that we're not uh, including in this presentation, but just within the the, the water system, uh, the architecture, uh, Montebello, the, uh, the the water tank uh, down in, in Curtis Bay. I mean, there's some really phenomenal uh, architecture associated with the water system. And this one uh, with its goth Gothic revival, uh, obviously, the, the hallmark of Gothic Revival is that pointed Gothic arch, uh, and you'll see those throughout this building. Um, you'll also see the, the pinnacle, which unfortunately is not attached to the building anymore, uh, but the, often like a, a spire with a pinnacle uh, is another uh, big uh, hallmark of this style. And then uh, what, the, what we call the uh, trefoils and quatrefoils, the four leaf and three leaf clovers uh, designs uh, throughout, very popular. And then the very steep gables that that work so well with those Gothic arches are another uh, hallmark of this style. So uh, this is really a great uh, example of it. Again, sort of a, ca a castle look, castle turret look, very popular throughout Baltimore with uh, all of our churches. You see a lot of Gothic Revival churches in Baltimore as well. Um, and so uh, the hope is that this building is going to uh, see um, some restoration in the, in the not too distant future. And uh, we're going to be enjoying it uh, for years to come. One of the problems, um, if we uh, just a quick note, too, I'll add to that as well, is um, what, what makes the 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 juxtaposition or the imposition of a Gothic revival architecture on something like waterworks. The, the problem with that is that, of course, now you have uh, a, a contradiction somewhat between, you know, the, the, the signifiers of ecclesiastical architecture and the utilitarian function of waterworks. Um, and so this, as you move into the 20th century, this was one of the things that pushed architects into trying to reconcile this con uh, this contradiction and move into a style of architecture that was not so ornamented um, and borrowing from earlier European 
precedence. Uh, we got away from that uh, so as to not be untruthful or confusing to the average viewer that would conflate or confuse uh, an ecclesiastical style with a, uh, a public works function. So Clifton Mansion, um, this is another great example of a park that was acquired uh, by the city that had a building on it already. And this, of course, as many of you know, is the former home of Johns Hopkins. Uh, and this was acquired in 1894 um, from Johns Hopkins University, uh, which had um, uh, it had been bequeathed to this property by Johns Hopkins, the man, uh, with the intention of using it for the campus. Uh, it was never used as such, and the, the university had no use for it uh, after they had selected um, another location for the campus. And so uh, the city bought it to turn it into a park. And all of the parks, too, it's worth noting, you know, why, did the city, why, why was the city acquiring these buildings and these parks? Well, a lot of it came out of the City Beautiful movement and um, the work of the Olmsted brothers. Uh, and it was a way of as an, an antidote to the ills of industrialization. Uh, urban life in the 19th century was pretty rough and tumble. Uh, and so it was seen as important by city leaders at the time to create green spaces as a kind of oasis, as a refuge uh, from the uh, pollution and the noise and other dangers of, of the industrialized urban center. Uh, and so, you know, all came along with those parks were these historic buildings. Uh, and so this is sort of how we see the um, uh, uh, cohesion or the uh, synergy uh, between uh, parks and historic preservation, which uh, continues to the present day. So now this particular uh, example of Italianate architecture, you'll note the dates of Italianate art architecture 1840 to 1885, and then you'll notice the date of Clifton Mansion 1802. Uh, this uh, is an older building that was updated to a more contemporary style. So uh, Johns Hopkins desired something a little more um, uh, up to date, a little more uh, high style, uh, and he went with uh, the Italianate architecture uh, noted with the, uh, with well, with the large uh, uh, tower, but also with the deep eaves uh, that we see in, in Italianate architecture uh, with large brackets holding up the deep eaves and the, uh, the arcade across the front. Um, all of these things, they're, 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 they're reminiscent of uh, a stylized Roman or Italian uh, architecture. Um, so yeah, the deep eaves, uh, let's see, the um, big brackets, very ornate cornices. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a wonderful example of uh, Italianate architecture, even though um, there's somewhere deep buried inside of there is a much older uh, historic structure. Uh, now, this is, of course, um, when we talk about civic pride, this is perhaps the most important uh, city hall. Obviously, it is the the locus of um, city uh, civic activity. Uh, now, City Hall uh, built in 1875. Uh, it was through a design competition uh, that George Frederick, the young, I think, 22 year old local architect, won the uh, design competition for City Hall. Uh, and uh, it is it has served its purpose valiantly since then. Uh, it underwent a major renovation in the mid 1970s, uh, which has the current configuration of um, intermediary floors that were inserted from the interior, if you've ever been in there. Uh, but City Hall is, um, you know, one of the 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 the, the image of City Hall has taken on a significance uh, in its own right, separate from the building. Uh, this the the photo of the dome uh, is you see it all over the place. Um, and uh, I'm, as a side note, very excited that you know my agency has been undertaking a major conservation of the exterior of the building, which started about three years ago. And we've been working our way around the exterior, uh, conserving and repairing the stonework, which was is made from locally quarried Cockeysville marble. Uh, and uh, shortly uh, upcoming within the next uh, year or two, we're going to be undertaking a major restoration of the dome itself, which is a very early example of uh, cast iron architecture uh, and the and the slate roof. 
Uh, so all of that, um, you know, demonstrates the city's commitment uh, to uh, historic preservation and to the preservation of the buildings that it owns. Uh, because again, this is one of the, a symbol of, of, of what makes Baltimore special. Um, and you, you think of these amazing pieces of architecture as, as sort of the hallmarks of, uh, of Baltimore's character. Uh, so Matt, uh, this is a second empire, right? Correct. So second empire, uh, in addition to the, uh, the round windows and, um, some of the, the other details on this, the hallmark, the main noticeable, recognizable uh, characteristic of Second Empire architecture is the mansard roof. And this has that uh, distinctive mansard roof with the double pitch, the very steep uh, pitched roof on the bottom and then the very flat, shallow uh, uh, pitch on the top. And that, um, is uh, uh comes uh, largely from france uh you'll see that um all throughout uh, uh uh paris and uh and all of your favorite uh, walt disney animated films you'll see these mansard roofs um and they're um they were designed uh to add an additional floor so that that roof is actual uh livable usable space versus in a gable or a hip roof. Um, and it's oftentimes uh, sheathed in slate like this one. Uh, you'll see that quite a bit. Uh, but the mansard roof is the is the distinguishing feature of the Second Empire, which is uh, considered part of the Victorian uh, period, uh, along with uh, the styles like Queen Anne or stick or shingle styles. Uh, the Second Empire is, a, is one of the Victorian styles of architecture. And, you know, I would be remiss, too, if I didn't point out um, sort of why we have this city hall uh, is because prior to the construction of the existing city hall, um, Baltimore City was located, the government was located in the Peel Museum, um, our host today. Uh, and so the Peel uh, had been purchased by the city in 1830 to serve as its first city hall. Uh, and, um, you know, by the time of the Civil War, the city had really outgrown the Peel. Uh, and so plans were made to construct the existing city hall, which is located because it's uh, literally one block away from the Peel. Uh, it's still in that central business district. And so um, you can see the contrast in terms of size. Uh, Baltimore really, at this point in time, was an industrial powerhouse. Uh, and it was punching above its weight class uh, when it constructed this building in order to replace the relatively humble Peel Museum building. Uh, and it, it's it's been said and often quoted uh, that City Hall, this City Hall, was built uh, on time and under budget. Uh, the city was very proud of itself at that at when it was built, and um, it, it it may have been the first and last time that ever happened. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's let, we'll move on to the next one. Um, Eastern Avenue pumping station, and you know, we were talking about waterworks infrastructure. This is another great example of uh, waterworks infrastructure, a really beautiful building. Um, and unlike the Clifton Park Valve House, this is one that continues to serve its original purpose, which is to pump sewage uh, out to Back River. Uh, and this, all of the, the, it's sort of at the low point in the city, right along the harbor. So all of the uh, uh, sanitary sewer lines uh, run down to this building, uh, which, and then they're pumped out uh, to, to the back river wastewater treatment plant. Uh, and it's much larger than it originally needed to be. It was the pumps were originally powered with uh, steam engines. Uh, now, now we have uh, higher tech pumps in there, but it's still in, in the original building and it is absolutely uh, a magnificent building. Um, and a real focal point downtown. In fact, Matt, you've, you've worked on this property yourself, haven't you? And yeah, during so, the restoration. So this is one that's a little special to me. This is one of the very first Baltimore buildings that I worked on for Worcester Eisenbrandt um, back in about 2008. And um, we, uh, the, 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 the windows are all copper clad. They're wooden windows with uh, copper cladding over top of them. And we, uh, we restored all those windows. Uh, and it's, it's a pretty fantastic uh, building uh, with a really great museum in it, by the way. Um, 
that's just uh, reopening. So if you have a chance, you can get inside the building as well. Um, so uh, Jackson and I have had quite the discussion about the um, the the architectural style of this building. Um, it's often referred to in in uh, documents throughout the city as a classical revival uh, building, and it's it does have a lot of uh, of of characteristics of that style. Um, the the pilasters, the the pedimented um, uh, foyer entryway, uh, the large pediments on the dormers, um, but it's it's a little bit more mixed than that. Uh, the architect, uh, a gentleman named Henry Bronze, uh, included uh, some other uh, details, such as the rusticated bottom floor uh, that may be a little more Renaissance revival or even, dare I say, Beaux-Arts. It's not the high style of Beaux-Arts that you would see, uh, say, at uh, Penn Station um, with all the ornament and, and, and swag. Uh, it's, it's much more understated. But it's um, it's just a little bit more than the classical revival as well, and that's pretty typical of architectural style. Not everything can be the McKim school, where it's a very uh, obvious choice of which style um, which style that building is. There are a lot of them. Uh, the architects drew from multiple different uh, ideas, and it's not quite that clean. So it's uh, it's it's a enjoyable to stand and study and maybe uh, discuss or uh, have good banter about uh, what everybody's thoughts on the style of some of these buildings are. But yes, if you get a chance, this is definitely worth a visit. It's a little bit unsung, a little bit uh, one that people kind of walk past or drive past uh, without, without really taking the time to study it. It is a pretty grand and impressive building. And, you know, when, when we talk about why Baltimore owns so many historic buildings, you know, you may also ask yourself, why does Baltimore continue to own historic buildings? And in the case of this building in particular, it's because they are still functioning as uh, an important, providing an important municipal service. Uh, they are still uh, useful buildings. These are not just museum pieces. Uh, this building, City Hall, others like it, uh, they are you know, your taxpayer dollars at work. Um, and so that's a nice feeling to know that they were built so durably uh, and with uh, so much character uh, that they can continue to be beautiful and serve their purpose, uh, you know, a century later. Uh, the War Memorial Building, um, this is another um, building that was purpose built, actually with a joint initiative with the state of Maryland. Uh, actually, I saw Denise Noe is here from the uh, Department of Veterans Affairs, um, and she and I have worked together on this building for many years. Uh, it is a memorial dedicated to Marylanders who fell in World War I uh, and was then later rededicated uh, for, to all 20th century foreign wars. Um, and uh, this is a uh, right across from City Hall, so a very visible location, um, also uh, a scene for civic pride. Uh, but it's also, too, what's interesting about this, this building is that it... Um, it sort of served another purpose, uh, which was to reconstruct the City Hall campus uh, with the idea of the City Beautiful movement uh, that you, you know, this came out of, you know, the idea that you wanted to create a beautiful plaza uh, that had uh, clean symmetrical lines in the style of uh, the neoclassicism, which Matt will talk about. Uh, but, you know, this is very typical of its time. And uh, it's also... Um, open to this day. Uh, we uh, it, A lot of people don't know that they can go inside, uh, but you can. Uh, we're open Monday through Friday, eight to four, and there's a small uh, museum on the first floor with uh, military memorabilia. Uh, but it's got a magnificent auditorium space upstairs, uh, which is used for uh, civic events to this day and, and public assembly. Uh, all sorts of different things happen there. Uh, we have about 50,000 visitors a year. Uh, so, you know, come on by and check it out. So the neoclassical style is is uh, again uh, another another classical architectural style drawing from the Greeks and the Romans, the Doric columns, the very temple like look. But this is much more austere. This is this is uh, talking about uh, again some civic pride, some some uh, national pride, uh, the the power of government. 
Um, it's, it's very monumental, very large. Uh, a lot of times the ornamentation on these buildings is much more understated. Um, so it's a very uh, austere and, and uh, it, it designed to be impressive and, um, and, and large and powerful. Um, You'll also note that the uh, in the front of the building there are uh, matching uh, statues on plinths of a horse and an eagle. Uh, now these, again, talking about the juxtaposition and the and the uh, the addition of additional styles, these have very uh, Art Deco lines with these uh, statues and carvings. So you've got the this this the neoclassical. Uh, building with an art deco uh, pieces of art in the front, um, all adding to make a very large, impressive uh, uh, civic building. Uh, another vis very visible building and another example of waterworks infrastructure. We've, we've got a lot of them today. Uh, the Roland Water Tower on, on Roland Ave. Um, this is a tower which was uh, built by the city for a uh, municipal use to hold water. Um, and uh, prior to the uh, creation of the existing system of reservoir reservoirs. Uh, however, this is one that um, became defunct relatively quickly. It stopped functioning as a water tower in the 1930s and has remained a kind of landmark ever since. Um, and uh, we, the Department of General Services and working um, with the uh, Roland Park Civic League, uh, completed an exterior uh, restoration of the tower. Uh, just, I think it was just finished that two years ago. And um, it's uh, going to continue to look great for years to come. And uh, this is one which has kind of almost become a sort of monument, uh, even though it had a very uh, utilitarian function to begin with. So the, uh, the Renaissance revival uh, architecture on this, uh, it's uh, often referred to as a wedding cake look. You've got the multiple different tiers uh, uh, with with very specific design and, and ornamentation, the rusticated bottom uh, uh, floor, and then the, uh, the, the, the higher up uh, portions are a little bit plainer and more decoration and a cornice at the top. You can see the sketch off to the side is sort of a more typical Renaissance Revival style building. Um, and the uh, and the the tower is is obviously a much smaller building, but got all that kind of wedding cake tiered look. Um, you you this building is, uh, is definitely one that you would look at it and think uh, that that was just lifted up out of Venice or Florence and and plopped down on Roland Avenue. Um, so it's got a definite look to uh, to that. Uh, oftentimes lower. Uh, peaked or hip roofs, uh, understated de details versus the Beaux Arts style, which is much. Uh, there's a lot more detail in Beaux Arts, but you'll see even the the swag over the door there, uh, which is a, a photo from pre-restoration. Um, we did clean that a little bit, and we did some uh, work on the grates and things. Uh, but again, really nice uh, carved details, uh, but a little bit more understated. Um, than you would see on a Beaux Arts, but just a really great example of uh, a Renaissance revival, and again, um, now worth uh, worth a stroll. Now, now, now worth a stroll around the 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 park and um, uh, checking out this really wonderful building and the restoration. And of course, I, I should have mentioned too that Matt's company uh, worked on the restoration, Worcester Eisenbrand. So I, I, I was remiss for not uh, acknowledging them. Uh, the Chick Webb uh, Recreation Center. Uh, this is a very important building, built in 1947. Uh, it was the uh, first. Um, it was, I believe, the first uh, swimming pool and also a uh, rec center that was open to African Americans uh, during segregation. And uh, it uh, has achieved landmark status now. And in fact, um, the city was just awarded this year a grant uh, from HUD in order to do a major restoration of it, uh, which we're very excited about. Um, and uh, dedicated, of course, to the uh, drummer, Chick Webb, uh, who's from Baltimore. And um, Matt, why don't you talk to us a little bit about the style, Art Moderne. Art, yeah, art uh, moderne or modern. Um, 
So this building was designed by a gentleman named Frederick A. Fletcher. Uh, it has uh, some of the hallmarks of the art modern period. It's not, it doesn't have the as many curves and, and rounded corners as some, but it's got the horizontal lines, the flat roof, the, the, all the windows lined up in horizontals, um, the very little ornamentation, much smoother, um, much more about massing and clean lines than about ornamentation and, uh, and, and decoration. Um, it's a very, uh, very nice mid-century uh, architectural style. Uh, there's multiple buildings in the area that have this style and they're very appealing for their simplicity and for their, uh, their, their, their just uh, wonderful um, uh, horizontal, like I said, horizontal lines and, uh, and clean uh, look. So we're getting now into um, a uh, the sort of the mid 20th century stuff here. Um, and, uh, you know, it did actually become, I think it was more difficult for Matt and I to find examples of uh, city owned buildings of uh, mid century modern uh, styles of design. Uh, I think part of that is the city. Uh, for a lot of its 20th century history, its building program for municipal buildings was rather conservative uh, in its architectural style. Um, and it was also, you know, um, there was a lot of uh, conformity uh, to the style of buildings that the city was constructing. If you look at a lot of the schools that were built from sort of the 1940s to the 1970s, uh, police stations, especially, you know, they have a lot of similarity, this kind of sort of generic modern look to them. Um, and that was intentional. It was uh, a way of kind of creating a standardized uh, version of a municipal structure. Uh, and uh, so you lose a little bit of the diversity of style that you saw in the 19th century buildings. Um, and it was particularly hard for us to find an example of brutalism uh, for a municipal building. But this is one um, that I absolutely love. This is the uh, Forum Fountain, which is behind Dunbar High School. And uh, this was um, up until just a couple years ago, true to the brutalist style, uh, exposed concrete. And I'll let, I'll let Matt talk about that. Um, but well, there's not a lot of information about this fountain. Um, we were able to find the name of the architect, uh, but there's some more research that needs to be done on this. Uh, but it is uh, just a, a great example of the kind of the sculptural massing elements of of the brutalist style. Yeah, so 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 Baltimore's, Baltimore's had quite the history uh, with the brutalist style. Uh, we've had uh, we've lost a couple of structures within um, the past number of years uh, that had. Uh, this style, uh, McKeldin Fountain and the Mechanic Theater. Um, and so uh, the hallmarks of this style, which are, again, a little bit disguised here uh, with the paint, and then also because it's a, a sculptural fountain and not uh, an actual structure, um, but generally a lot of cast concrete with uh, exposed form lines, um, a lot of hard angles, and uh, not a lot of in a, in a building, not a lot of windows. Um, it's considered a very severe um, and austere and and uh, style. And, and unfortunately, many people find it unattractive. And that's been uh, to its detriment. If be, so many buildings have been lost um, because of that. Um, but it's it's actually uh, can be uh, rather remarkable in its uh in in the the juxtaposition of the mass uh from from parts of the structure to other parts of the structure and um some of the uh the 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 angles and the way that the the building uh very much again like going back to chick chick web again looking at it as uh more of the entire structure versus the details and the uh the the, the ornamentation and now you've taken that to the extreme where it's really all about the shape and the, the, the massing and not about any kind of decoration or, uh, or ornamentation.
Okay, and here we go to, um, I think this is the last one, right, Matt? That's correct. Uh, so um, the, the the aquarium, ma many of you on the call probably uh, have memories of the aquarium being constructed. Um, this is, uh, you know, one of the uh, really iconic buildings uh, in the uh, Inner Harbor area as part of what was termed in the 70s, the Baltimore Renaissance uh, and the revitalization of Harbor Place uh, and designed as a tourist attraction as part of Baltimore's transition from an industrial-based economy to a service-based economy uh, and diversifying its, ec its economic prospects, uh, Baltimore attempted to attract uh, tourists and make Harbor Place a, a world-class tourist attraction. And so the aquarium was the centerpiece of that push. Um, kind of at the time too, though, it was viewed as a sort of boondoggle. Uh, it was not such a sure thing that it would become the success that we know it today. Uh, and it was paid for uh, by uh, city money. It was a city, the city floated a, a bond in order to fund the construction of the aquarium. And, and in fact, even though it is operated at an arm's length, by uh, the aquarium, uh, the city still owns the building to this day. Uh, it is a public work and a public asset. And uh, that's that's a nice thing uh, for us. You know, there's a lot of talk, especially now about sort of the privatization of public space. Um, and this is a great example of how, you know, the public sector can take the lead in terms of creating beautiful cities uh, and, and great attractions for people. Um, and so the uh, style is also very unusual. And Matt and I had a nice conversation about that. Matt, why don't you talk about it a little? Sure. So. Yeah, it's it's kind of a fascinating structure uh, as far as architectural style is concerned, and I and honestly I hadn't really considered it too much, uh, being a more of a older building person, uh, and and Jackson uh, suggested it uh, as a postmodern uh, style of architecture, and postmodern is is a reaction to the severity of those other. Uh, structures we were just talking about the the, the brutalist and the uh, international style and and buildings that uh, were all about uh, structure and not about more or uh, the, the the earlier uh, more ornamented styles and so um, as I was out and about taking photos of some of these buildings I was walking from Eastern Avenue pumping station uh, across the pedestrian bridges behind and coming up to this building from the from the rear and it struck me that uh the lower half of this building is very brutalist uh it's actually a, a, a brutalist structure and then the reaction that postmodern reaction is actually happening within the same structure with the uh obvious obviously the big glass pyramids and the uh very colorful tile work on the front uh the the, the bands of glass through it uh, so it's it's almost uh, postmodern, all in one the, the the reaction all in one building, showing the 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 older uh, more austere style with the new reaction just right attached to it. So it's it's actually a really wonderful example of of that moment in architectural history. And that moment in Baltimore history, too, because, you know, don't forget, you know, this was built at a period of transition for the city itself. Um, and uh, and so, you know, that that symbolized quite nicely by this building. So that's everything we've got. Uh, thank you uh, to the stalwart um, attendees who have uh, lasted throughout this talk. Uh, we hope you found it interesting. And I guess with that, we'll maybe turn it back over to Shantae to do a little Q&A if we have a few minutes. I mean, we may be uh, encroaching on our time, but uh, Matt and I will, will stick around if there are questions, if uh, you will stick with us. All right. So, um... well, I have about a thousand questions for you, if I may. Oh, yes, uh, please. <laughs> but, well, I'll just try to slip one in here quickly. Does the city still acquire historic buildings? Uh, well, the, the truth is that the city has not been acquiring a lot of buildings in general. Um, in terms of it, with the intent of using them for municipal 
functions. Uh, so that includes historic buildings. Uh, in general, uh, the city has perhaps more square footage than it needs to deliver the uh, services that are required of it. Uh, and that has to do with sort of the it being a legacy city uh, that it was historically much larger than it is today in terms of population. Uh, and so uh, there are there are uh, exceptions to that rule, but but generally speaking, no, we're not we're not acquiring as many buildings as we once were. Uh, now that's putting aside buildings that the city has acquired because of condemnation. Um, if it's the property is abandoned, that's a that's a separate thing. But in terms of municipal use, um, there's uh, there's not a lot of new new acquisition. No. So um, there's some questions inside the chat that I think would need to be answered. And what we might have to do because it is one o'clock is send those over to Jackson, um, if you don't mind, and you can respond to them in email and then we can send them out um, because there's one that's in here that's quite lengthy. I'd like to say it. Can you talk about any initiatives to soften brutalist modernist architecture in the city's current portfolio? with artwork, mosaics, or other decorative elements rather than um, strict preservation versus destruction modernist works of the time, like the loss of the mechanics theater complex, like postmodern aquarium, thanks. And that came from uh, Lori S. So well, I, I think, think okay. Can answer that quickly? Go ahead. Um, so I wanted you to know, can you answer that quickly? Oh yeah, so I mean, Matt, you can jump into if you want, but like I, I think the example we presented is a great example of of, of the an attempt to soften brutalism, right? That playground that we showed, or the uh, the fountain, I mean, uh, was exposed concrete. I think up until 2017, I think was when it was painted. Um, and you know, that's one where architectural historians cringe at that paint a little bit because the philosophy behind brutalism was that it was exposed concrete. The term brutalism comes from the French baton brew, just meaning exposed concrete. Uh, it's it's sort of a misnomer a little bit because we think of brutalism in a negative connotation, but it's actually much more neutral. Uh, however, that said, uh, I think that if we can get this otherwise rather disliked style to be a little bit more approachable, uh, then, you know, that's a good way of not letting any uh, perfect be the enemy of the good uh that you know maybe we should be exploring things like painting it if if the public responds to that in a favorable way i don't know matt what do you think well it's, it presents a difficult problem as a preservationist uh to to do anything to alter the original intent and design and again you know it, it so much depends on the on the, the structure and uh its use and its importance its age there's so many factors that come into play, um, but uh, you know, so so it becomes difficult whether or not something can be adjusted or modified in a way that, um, while demolition is ultimately losing uh, the building, uh, is modification causing a similar uh, situation as far as losing the original intent of the building. So it's a complicated, it's a complicated answer. Um, again. Um, you know, I think that the, the the fountain example that we were showing, uh, the paint is 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 a, a, an effort to make it a, a little bit more inviting, um, and I think it works. I think it's it's pleasant, um, but it does lose some of the intent of the original uh, design. So there's a trade off there. Um, so I want to add something before we close. Um, so the heritage area is one of our um, strictest, um, I guess, uh, themes is to preserve the history of, of Baltimore for the future generations. So before we close, I would like to recommend that people recommend or suggest take on this philosophy. As you encounter people about uh, our, our city's history, and um, there are there are dark parts of our history. And one of the things that uh, Jackson mentioned was um, a, a sense of pride, a sense of citizenry, and having respect for um, the lands that were um, taken from the Native Americans. But I, in between those two things, I would like you to take away the thought 
that we have a number of people that are not invested in Baltimore the way that preservationists are um, or civic leaders are, is to remind our young people that these places were built more than likely by enslaved, indentured people from other lands um, because that was a way of having labor, cheap labor. And most of these people came with great talents. And so they usurped their talents to build these structures. Of course, they had the supervisor or the uh, uh, architects in there, but most of the labor was by enslaved or indentured peoples. So we have to keep that in mind. And that is a way to ingratiate um, pride in your city is to think that your any place that you touch in Baltimore is probably was touched by your great, great or greater grandparents. So you should be prideful that this work was done by those people. I say that because it is important to get everyone engaged in why we should preserve the history and the legacy of our city. So I'm gonna close on that. I recommend, please send your emails if you have questions to sdaniels at baltimoreheritageareaorg I will forward the email to Jackson or Matt as appropriate because I don't want them to get inundated. These gentlemen have taken their time to present today. They do have jobs. And this was a gift from both of them to do this presentation. So I appreciate that. And I also want to uh, tell the Peel that it was fabulous to be able to work with them this last quarter. We are looking to do this next year. And we want anybody that's on the call today, if you have an idea for a It's More Than History lecture, please send that to me as well. And I want to thank you all for participating on this rainy day and wishing you a wonderful summer. Engage with us because there's more to come from the heritage area. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Jackson. Thank you, Nancy and her team for um, putting up with the heritage area and all that we are trying to do to preserve Baltimore's legacy. Thank you. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Thank Thank you you very much, Thanks. Bye-bye.